Jen. Debbie, you mind going back to the first slide? Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for this webinar co-hosted by MHA and the Department of Public Health called Care of the Infant with RSV in the NICU. Uh, my name is Pat Noga, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Adam Del Molino and Dr. Steve Defesse to uh, co-host this uh, with you. Uh, moving along to the next slide, um, you will see the, um, the faculty will be speaking with you today, um, and they'll be introducing themselves as they each um, come on to present to you. Of note, uh, we are recording this session. We also will have the recording and the slides available to you after the conference, um, both on our MHA and our Patient Care Link websites. And um, we will be taking questions um, as we're able to um, towards, towards the end of the um, presentation um, and feel free to record them in the chat as the speakers present. Uh, with that, I will move, now we'll move to the next slide so you can see the objectives that have been set up um, to be covered during today's program. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Estefan Garcia. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I just want to take a, one second to thank Dr. Hansen and the uh, Boston Children's uh, NICU team for all of their um, uh, support in this process and the work um, that, uh, that that goes into being able to care for infants with RSV in the NICU setting. Um, this is certainly something that the Department of Public Health had an interest in understanding if it was applicable across sites as we have been um, uh, you know, dealing with uh, significant uh, capacity constraints across um, the state. Um, and so, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Hansen and her team and just thank you again for uh, participating with us on this call. Great, thank you. Um, so we are really so happy to present um, care of infants with RSV in the NICU as requested by um, the group that just did our introduction. Um, I see some familiar names over there on the side chat. So hello to a couple of old friends. Um, and I'm going to be speaking over the course of about 15 minutes, uh, sharing the slide deck with Kevin Bullock, who's our Director of Respiratory Therapy. And then we also have Cheryl Toole and Denise Casey, who are going to be available to answer questions at the end. We're going to try to get through the slides fairly quickly because I think that um, it would be really valuable to hear your questions. So without further ado, um, please um, go to the next slide. Um, so the I think everyone's aware if they've been reading AAP recommendations about RSV that less is more when it comes to RSV care. So it really all comes down to supportive care. There is no direct treatments available for RSV. Um, so with that said, we're going to talk quickly about respiratory care, infectious disease care, fluid nutrition, and sedation management. Next slide. So in terms of respiratory management of patients with RSV, um, we tend to escalate our care. Uh, to achieve goal sets in the 95 to 99 percent range, to keep patients uh, from not having more than a mild respiratory acidosis and fairly comfortable work of breathing. So depending on how ill they are when we show up, our lowest support would be low flow nasal cannula. We would then escalate to high flow nasal cannula that we think of giving between about four and 10 liters per minute flow. Um, we uh, make sure to provide humidification with that high flow cannula and adjust the FiO2 to achieve O2 SAC goals. If high flow cannula is not cutting it, then we step up to CPAP. Again, we think about um, providing then five to 10 centimeters of uh, water pressure, and again, adjust the FiO2 uh, with a blended oxygen supply to achieve our O2 SAT goals. Um, if patients have a lot of apnea, we consider uh, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Um, though often we'll skip straight from CPAP to intubation and mechanical ventilation for patients who need further support. And in generally, we, we go with a lung protective strategy 
thinking about pressure limited modes and adjust um, the settings based on a gold blood gas in the 730 to 740 range for a pH with PCO2s in the 50s and PO2s greater than 90. Um, we try to provide frequent suctioning at least every four hours. Um, for patients who are intubated, consider providing lidocaine through the ET2 to inhibit paroxysmal cough, and then also frequent position changes for postural drainage and chest PT if needed. Um, this is actually something that's not uh, promoted by the 2014 AAP guidelines, but I will say that we do um, provide chest PT a fair bit with our patients. It's thought to prompt coughing, but I think we generally find that the benefits outweigh the risks. Of note, albutavol nebs for uh, wheezing, we do give. Um, they're specifically not recommended by the 2014 AAP guidelines. They're thought to provide um, transient benefit, but not have a longer term effect on degree of uh, mechanical ventilation or hospitalization. But I will reveal that if we have patients with a lot of wheezing, we do give them PRN albuterol nebs. Um, we will give normal saline nebs if we need to help with secretion mobilization. But steroids, epinephrine nebs, and hypertonic saline nebs are definitely not recommended by the AAP. Next slide. So Kevin, our respiratory therapy manager is gonna, um, director is gonna go over the next couple of slides with a little bit more detail about the respiratory support. Thank you, Anne. Since uh, obviously respiratory is a major component of the management of RSV, I thought I would break down uh, Dr. Hansen's bullet points just a little bit to remind you of some key things in each of those steps along your escalation pathway. So when we're first using low flow nasal cannula, we need to keep in mind that it's a low flow variable device though we drive it from a 100% oxygen source, we are very rarely delivering anywhere near 40% FiO2 because it's dependent upon your patient's rate pattern and depth of breathing. And presumably with RSV, they're a bit tachypnic, they're a little bit uh, uncoordinated with their breathing, so they'll entrain more room air. But it is a good, temp <clears throat> excuse me, temporizing measure in a frontline intervention as you're waiting for other resources to arrive to the bedside. I would recommend that we don't ever exceed even probably five liters per minute, but I put six on this slide due to back pressure through the system. The cannulas are smaller, the bore of the tubing is smaller, and you run the risk of some mucosal drying leading to nosebleeds for any prolonged period of time. Next slide, please. So as you escalate through and up to your limit for low flow nasal cannula, if you're still unable to maintain your saturations, you might try a high flow nasal cannula system. We here at Boston Children's use Vapotherm. Uh, but there certainly is a Fisher and Pikel system, a Hudson Teleflex system, multiple options for high flow nasal cannula. It really is better humidification at those higher flow rates, providing up to 100% relative humidity, which should be your goal. And a good starting point, we tend to like to get ahead of ourselves and spend the rest of the time weaning in our day here. Uh, so we would start at two liters per kilogram per minute of flow on your patient. And then if we're able to back off from there, we would back off. And that's not to say you can't inch up over two liters per kilogram per minute, but you just want to be careful to exceed anywhere above two and a half to three liters per kilogram per minute. Again, you're running into some back pressure issues. And if you're having to escalate that far, you really probably need a, a better line of therapy. You can certainly provide a higher FiO2 with high flow. The goal there is to exceed your patient's inspiratory flow demands and create a reservoir in their upper airway of near 100% oxygen or whatever FiO2 you are setting. You will be able to accommodate that for your patient if you're uh, meeting their inspiratory flow demands. The secondary benefit of high flow nasal cannula is to wash out anatomic dead space to improve work of breathing. So obviously your anatomic airways do not conduct gas exchange, but that can be a reservoir for CO2 retention. With the higher flow rates of high flow nasal cannula, you'll wash out that reservoir of CO2 and hopefully reduce some of the work of breathing with that washout. So now it should not be considered delivery of positive pressure. I think oftentimes we talk about going up on high flow, providing some positive pressure. There is some data to suggest in our smallest patients, premature infants less than 1,000 grams, you might get some benefit of positive pressure. But generally, our bigger RSV patients, six months and above, you're not really going to get any benefit of positive pressure, just the previous two bullet points of dead space washout and oxygen reservoir. As you capture a patient, and most often we are able to capture them with high flow nasal cannula, we'll wean our FiO2 down to 30% before we start thinking about weaning our flow rates. And the goal there again is if you're going to transition to a low flow oxygen system, you really have trouble exceeding 30% FiO2. So you wanna make sure that you're adequately supporting your patient oxygen wise before you go weaning your leader flows. 
And one thing that comes up quite frequently is if we can feed our NICU patients while they're on high flow nasal cannula. The data do show that there are rare adverse events while feeding on high flow nasal cannula. So you can feed with it. And sometimes if you're still a little trepidatious, you might be able to turn your leader flow down a little bit to allow them to feed and then turn that back up when they're done feeding. Next slide. So now high flow nasal cannula, you get to your two liters per kilogram per minute or more. Uh, you would consider transitioning to a positive pressure device. And so that's when you would step in and think about doing standalone CPAP to aid in your lung expansion and oxygenation. As Dr. Hansen alluded to, we would not exceed 10 centimeters of water starting at five and entering our way up uh, to titrate to effect. In the NICU population, you would generally use a nasal prongs or a small nasal mass. The Fisher and Pico system is a good transition to avoid nasal breakdown between the prongs and mask there for less than a year of age. And then we manage patients obviously here with RSV greater than one year of age. So we would transition to a different type of nasal oral interface for those patients. If your CPAP is still not holding and you're on a high FiO2 and you're reaching 10 centimeters of water, you can consider non-invasive positive pressure via a ram cannula or the prongs that you might be using. And you can do that with a ventilator on a dual limb system. And again, similar to BiPAP in older patients would be to unload your work of breathing, aid in oxygenation. Triggering can be very difficult through prongs or a ram cannula on a mechanical ventilator. So you just want to make sure that you're putting your respiratory rate high enough that you might find a bit of synchrony with your patient to support them and ensure you're at using high enough peak inspiratory pressures and PEEP levels on your non-invasive to support them. Because depending upon the device that you're using, that pressure delivery will vary to some degree. Next slide. Worst case scenario, none of these things are working and you make the choice to go ahead and electively intubate your patient. We have our standards for how we're going to go ahead and intubate. And I think Anne has some uh, information on slides about what we should do to do that. But from my perspective as a respiratory therapist, RSV is all about time constant management. So is this atelectasis from secretion retention or is this bronchospasm or is it airway edema as bronchiolitis suggests? So when we have our smaller patients, if we go back to our uh, equations and physics, laws of physics, radius to the fourth power in our smallest patients, any change in airway caliber will cause a huge problem with airways resistance. And I think we often forget that we have just as much trouble getting gas in as we get with getting it out. Uh, so that I try to really harp on that when we're talking about management of time constants is you might have to go above your higher inspiratory time than your 0 0.3, 0 0.35, 0 0.4 that is standard for a NICU to try to get more laminar flow into your patient and deliver that breath a little bit more slowly. But while you're going up on that inspiratory time to do that, get that gas in at less pressure, you have to worry about your IDE ratios and allowing your patient enough time to exhale. So it's a delicate balance of the resistance with the in out of gas flow. The other component is your compliance. If you're not getting enough volume into your patients, you'll get atelectasis. If you have secretion retention or they're dehydrated and have mucus plugging, you'll get a lot of atelectasis, which necessitates using a little bit more PEEP. Try to keep your airways open, stent the alveoli open to aid in your oxygenation and ventilation. And in doing that, our goal is to limit our pressures. And so here we would use pressure limited modes of ventilation for your dynamic airways changes and resistance and compliance, pressure control or pressure regulated volume control. I think my personal opinion here is that pressure control is slightly easier to tease out a resistance or compliance issue. You can adjust things and use your graphics a little bit more on the ventilator to help figure that out. When you titrate PEEP up and you capture lung volume in pressure control, your volumes will go up at that given pressure, even with potentially a change in your delta pressure. Uh, so to me, pressure control gives you a little bit more information and a little bit more use of your graphics to be able to adjust your settings. However, pressure regulated volume control is also a good mode. It will limit your volume, uh, your pressure delivery with each of those volumes. So you set your regulatory pressure and your pressures will fluctuate in and of that. My concern there is you don't know if that's airways resistance secretions or atelectasis when your peak inspiratory 
pressure increases in PRVC. So you have to do a little bit more diagnosing of what's going on and why your pressures are increasing. Maybe you give a nub, maybe you suction, maybe you titrate your PEEP and you will see your pressures come down. And then you learn from that to manage your patient and pressure regulated volume control going forward. The best reason to use pressure regulated volume control is that it's a fixed minute ventilation. So if you have all these dynamic changes, the ventilator is going to try to adjust itself to achieve that volume. So you know that your gas exchange will to some degree stay stable versus pressure control, where if you have a dramatic drop in your tidal volumes, you will underventilate until somebody's able to respond and treat the patient according to what they need at the time. So again, the goal really, when you're ventilating, mechanical ventilating, limit those pressures. You're going to have a lot of dynamic changes in airways compliance and resistance. So if you're limiting the pressures and using the information on the ventilator to help guide you, you're better able to optimize that ventilation for your specific patient. Because we all know we might all have RSV, but you don't all act the same. And so we have to tease that out and treat you slightly differently depending on which component is worse for you. That's it for the ventilatory. Next Thank slide. you, Kevin. Okay, so I just have a couple of slides on the rest of the uh, management of these babies. Obviously, the respiratory piece is by far the most important, so we decided to spend a little bit of extra time there. So in terms of the infectious disease management, uh, the most important thing is contact precautions. So that's gown and gloves, though in the era of COVID, we're all wearing masks as well. And then really, really um, careful hand hygiene. If the patient is afebrile and is having a typical course for RSV, there's actually no need for any bacterial sepsis evaluation evaluation or certainly for the administration of antibacterial antibiotics. But if the baby has a fever or has a lack of timely improvement, we expect to see these kids start to improve over the sort of two to seven day range, then it's important to rule out bacterial infection. And so that would be a CBC, a chest X-ray, blood and urine culture. And then if the patient's intubated, a respiratory culture. Um, and then if those are concerning to start um, coverage with antibiotics for a secondary bacterial infection. Next slide. Um, in terms of fluid and nutrition, um, there's usually an initial need to provide some fluid resuscitation, depending on how dehydrated the patient has um, become before presentation to medical care. Once the patient is euvolemic, we provide either IV or enteral nutrition and hydration at maintenance. Um, we try to over, um, avoid overhydration to avoid pulmonary edema, but we also don't want to provide underhydration and have the secretions be very dry. So IV fluids, we typically would give 100 milliliters per kilo per day, more if there's uh, fever or if the patient, as I said, came in with decreased oral intake. And then enteral feeds, usually we start at 150 milliliters per kilo per day. Um, also, though, if the parents know how much the patient was taking at baseline, um, we'll just give that or else um, start at the 150 and then adjust for perceived hunger. Um, the decision whether to give IV or enteral um, nutrition and hydration really depends on the degree of cardiorespiratory instability. Um, if there's concerns for unstable oxygenation or blood pressure or the impending need for endotracheal intubation, we'll give IV fluids. If we think that the inability to provide enteral nutrition will last for more than around three days, then we want to put in a central line and provide parental nutrition. But if there's stable oxygenation and blood pressure and the respiratory status seems captured, then we generally start NG feeds while on positive pressure ventilation. Um, we can discuss the high flow thing. We, I typically don't feed on high flow. I think it's largely just that the patients tend to be tachypneic, but certainly we don't um, orally feed on CPAP. And then obviously you can't do that with mechanical ventilation. Um, and if the respiratory distress includes tachypnea with a respiratory rate greater than 60, then we offer NG rather than PO feeds. Next slide, please. Um, the other piece that's really important is providing adequate pain and sedation management. So kids who are on non-invasive support typically don't require any sedation. Um, we generally provide intubation with uh, uh, rapid sequence intubation, atropine, versed, fentanyl, and rocuronium. These are older patients and they really do well with this combination rather than um, uh, uh, providing um, less sedation and then really struggling to get them intubated. Um, and then we adjust the sedation to tolerate mechanical ventilation by monitoring uh, pain and the uh, SBS score. Um, we typically provide an SBS score of minus one to minus two during the acute illness and then zero to minus one as approaching extubation. And the two agents that we most typically use are morphine and Versed. 
We typically start our morphine at a dose of 0.05 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And then if there's ongoing distress due to pain, we increase it by 10% until we achieve our goal SBS and pain score. And Versed, like also we typically start at 0.05 milligrams per kilogram per hour. And if there's ongoing distress due to agitation, then we increase it by 10% until we can achieve, sorry for the typo, our goal SBS score. Next slide. Um, and then in terms of weaning, if babies have been on either of these agents for less than five days, you can just go ahead and turn it off without um, them withdrawing. So you're welcome to wean or, with, or DC at whatever is clinically indicated. If they're on it for between five and 14 days, then we'll typically wean the Versed 10% twice a day as tolerated to off and then do the same with the morphine. And if they're on, this should be very unusual for more than 14 days, then we would wean the Versed 10% once a day as tolerated to off and then the same with the morphine. And we monitor for withdrawal with NAS scoring. And I think I have one more slide, which is just to say, um, our understanding is that there are folks who are working in level three NICUs who are interested in potentially taking care of babies with RSV who are admitted through the emergency department and coming into your NICU. We hope that with these very basic guidelines, you would have some um, comfort in getting started caring for these kids, but this really is something where experience is helpful. And so we honestly would love to hear from you. The phone number here is um, the attending phone line. There's a neonatologist carrying that phone. 24 seven, 365. So you really are welcome to call and ask for questions. And then if it's something that uh, is more pertaining to our respiratory therapy or nursing colleagues, we would find the help that you need and, and try to um, really be there with you while you're trying to do this. So this is a very quick overview with the goal that now we could turn to questions and um, our, um, whether they're for myself or for the Denise and Cheryl or for Kevin, we would uh, love to hear what you guys are thinking. If you've tried to do this already, or if you're thinking about moving in this direction, how we could help you. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks so much for um, that presentation. Really helpful. Um, and I think that for folks who may have attended our previous presentations with high flow nasal cannula um, for bronchiolitis and RSV um, uh, at the, the inpatient unit or in the emergency department, there are some differences here. And I think that's important for us to, to understand um, what you start at, you know, an oral, older child to be able to be to tolerate um, starting at two liters per minute is not something that we recommend. And so that is, uh, you know, for an older child, we usually start at one um, because they they do have some difficulty. Um, so, you know, there are some differences here. I'm so glad we were able to present, um, you were able to present this information. Um, and then if folks are interested in nasal cannula and obtaining a nasal cannula, um, uh, um, high flow nasal cannula equipment, the um, Department of Public Health um, has purchased those. We have them in our warehouse. We have been supplying um, nasal cannula to folks um, and uh, uh, to hospitals across the Commonwealth, um, and you can reach out to me, and we can set you up with um, those devices, um, which will make things easier um, as they have become uh, difficult to find um, if you're not accustomed to using them and having ordered them before. So thank you um, so much for that. Um, I'll ask the first question, and then we'll see if we get some others. I know we're, we're short on time, but just for the, our nursing colleagues, the question uh, from Children's, the question of do you assign nurses specifically, like I'm the RSV nurse, right, or I'm the um, non-RSV SV nurse. So if we could have, uh, I know I encountered that question when I was speaking with our NICUs across the state and just wondering if someone would be willing to answer that. Hi, um, I'm Cheryl Tom, the nursing director in the NICU, and Denise Casey is the nurse practice specialist. Um, when we were in an open bay design, we actually did try to cohort these patients. So we tried to keep them in all together in a specific area now that we're all single rooms. Um, that is not necessary and we really don't cohort them um, in any consecutive order in the room numbers. Um, and then we do not specifically have like an RSV nurse. So any of our nurses could be caring for patients with RSV. I mean, depending on a lot of different um, scenarios, you know, if if all the stars align, it is helpful to have them have, you know, if they are paired to have both of their patients with RSV, but we just don't have full flexibility to be able to do that just given the layout of the unit and how patients get admitted and what rooms are available. But um, we use, you know, very, very vigilant infection control practices. And I will say, even in our open bay design, mm -hmm. um, we did exceptionally well um, preventing the transmission of RSV and what was 
definitely not ideal space. Um, but I think, you know, the nurses just with their precautions and hand washing um, and just high vigilance and really education, I think just teaching them, you know, reminding them of how it is spread and why it's so important to kind of have those vigilant practices. Denise, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else. No, I mean, I think you hit everything um, that I was going to say, um, you know, especially that we did use to cohort patients if um, we could, or just the only two single rooms that we had in our old unit. But yes, now we don't need to do that. And I, you know, just reiterate exactly what Cheryl said, um, just about the vigilance around precautions. Um, yeah, is really the our mainstay, you know, which will keep hopefully, you know, RSV at bay, like, you know, to the patients that came in with it. And Debbie, we can actually stop sharing the screen. It might be more helpful for people to see. Thank you so much. Great. Um, any other uh, questions that folks have? Um, I know that was one of the big ones was whether or not, um, you know, the, uh, from a nursing perspective, there were limitations on who they could care for. I think some of the other um, questions that came up um, were more specific to, you know, some of the equipment needs. Um, mm -hmm. I think that was helpful um, to, to, to go through that and understand that there is equipment available through the state. Um, and then uh, the, the question, and I guess this is, you know, which RSV patients are the appropriate RSV patients for a, um, you know, for a NICU. And, and I think, you know, uh, obviously um, some of our NICUs that we're considering um, the, the potential of these admissions, you know, do you have an age cutoff? What is your age cutoff for the appropriate RSV uh, patient? Um, I can take that one. We have a cutoff of six months corrected age. So six months after their due date, we really try to send them to our medical or medical surgical ICU. And if they're under six months corrected age, we preferentially, the younger, the better for us being a NICU, but we're happy to take anybody who's under that cutoff. Um, and for us, it really honestly just depends on where the beds are in the hospital. But we were asked to do this starting probably 10 years ago or so because RSV just, you know, even though this is a particularly terrible season, it always is a big stressor on our bed system. And so we started doing this. And as a NICU, I think initially people were a little bit uneasy with this. And I have to say, um, it has been um, easy to learn how to do and to do well, and it's been a huge benefit for the hospital to be able to spread these kids out across all our ICUs if we need to. And I will transparently say I was in Denise's role when we started this, and I was one of those that said, we're going to do what? Like, we definitely understand being NICU people and being super um, appropriately protective of our tiny vulnerable patients that this is, you know, not something that I think organically we all thought, you know, was a great idea out of the gate. But, you know, now having seen a very long track record of, of very effectively being able to manage and, and both, you know, prevent transmission, but also manage these patients clinically and, and doing it so well with the NICU care that, you know, with those other needs that they require, it really is very much possible and we're there to help support whatever great. you might Thank you so much. I, again, I have to, you know, the, 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 in the ideal situation, um, you know, we wouldn't be asking hospitals to be considering this, understanding the concerns about RSV and, and contagion and all of those situations. But, you know, as we continue to move, you know, as a state um, through this winter, our, our fear, while our RSV numbers are significantly lower than they have been, um, the, you know, um, our beds are still being required in our ICUs now by influenza patients. Um, so, any ability to have a bit of a, a, a way to support um, our PICU colleagues who have really been at it for, and, and not that our NICU colleagues haven't, but the PICU <laughs> at it for months, um, uh, it would be really um, helpful. So thank you. I think this was a great overview. Um, feel free to submit questions. Um, continuing, uh, if you have questions, I know uh, Dr. Hansen and her team offered their a phone line, um, which is uh, fantastic. And um, hopefully, as we move forward, um, you know, this will be a, um, we'll, we'll continue to offer other educational um, activities with MHA as needed. Um, uh, but for now, thank you very much. I um, wish everybody a, a great holiday season um, and a great new year. Pat? Thank you, Dr. Garcia. And thank you very much, Dr. Hansen and your team. Um, as we noted before, we will be uh, posting this recording and the slides um, just as soon as we're able to for anybody who'd like to access them. And um, all the best to everybody. Thank you. Happy Thank holidays, you. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.